Machnas Akum, Volume 5, Yoradea, page 145. Over the, last, over the last two shirim, we have learned about a number of halachot related to food produced or prepared by Gentiles. In the next two shirim, we'll learn about another halacha related to Gentiles, that of Tfilas Kalim. But in contrast to the previous ones, which focused on food, this halacha focuses on utensils that once belonged to Gentiles. The halacha of Tfilas Kalim dictates that when kitchen and eating utensils are purchased from a Gentile, they must be immersed in a proper mikvah. This halacha is derived from the Torah's instructions regarding spoils of war obtained by the Jewish people in their battle against Midian, which is recorded at the end of Sefer Bamidbar. Kol davar asher yavo ba'esh, taviru ba'esh v'taher. Anything that, anything that is exposed to fire, like a cooking vessel, you have to kasher through fire. So that's the concept of Kabolo Kach Polto. This has to do with Heksher Kelim, not Vilas Kelim. That means vessels absorb prohibited flavors. And we've learned now for the last almost six months that concept that you need Heksher Kelim. You have to kasher a vessel. Now, the, now the, each vessel is kashered, and we're going to have two major shiurim on Hechsher Kalim, through this principle of Kaboiloi Kach Palto, the way that utensil absorbs the flavor, it's that mechanism, the same mechanism it gets rid of it. So, so if, if a, a grill, you grill a non kosher piece of meat directly on a fire, so that grill absorbs its prohibited flavor through fire. So in order to kasher that grill, you need libun gomer, you need fire. On the other hand, if you have a vessel that absorbs prohibited flavor through cooking with water, and you put uh, you know, a non-kosher piece of meat in a pot with water and you cook it, so that pot requires hechsher through water, hot water. So that's, so the first part of the pasuk, when it says called Dovar Shayabobesh Tavir Baesh Vitaher, that refers to kashering it of the of the of the uh, prohibited flavors that are absorbed within the cleave. Ah, Bemeni Da Yishata. But there's another requirement we're gonna see. Since this utensil passed from the possession of the Midianites to the possession of the Israelites. It also has to go through mikvah like a meinida does. So Rashi explains that although the simple context of the pasuk is referring to kashering non-kosher utensils, which we will learn about how, how you perform that later on, that we use, because these utensils were used with non-kosher food and we have to purify them from impurity. Chazal, though, interpreted the reference to the waters of Nida, which says, Ach b'meni da yishata, as being a mikvah, in which women who is a Nida must immerse to become Tor. This is a reference to the mitzvah of Tfilas Kelim, which must also be performed when purchasing a utensil owned by Gentiles, in addition to kashering them. Like Rashi says, Ach the, there, by the Gemara, excuse me, um, this is Rashi in Bamidbar. Ach the main nida yischata, lefip shuto. That means according to the way you understand the main nida yischata, chitu is elatar mitumas meis. It means to purify from tuma. Amar lem trichim akelim giul latar min ayisur. You need two processes. These utensils need hechsher to purify them from the prohibited flavor that's in them. And it needs immersion in a mikvah to be metar them from tumah. That when we kosher vessels with prohibited food, it's referring to metal kalim. 
Mayim Aru'im Likfol Be'em Nida. That's a different tefila. That's a tefila in a similar way that women are toiva, like in a mikvah. Kamahim are boim so. So we see Rashi very clearly touching up the pasuk, teaching us that it refers to two types of tefila. Tefila is kelim. Anytime you buy a vessel from a gentile, it's got to be immersed in a mikvah. It has nothing to do with whether the vessel had been used for prohibited food or not. It, just the transferring from the possession of a gentile to possession of a Jew requires tefila in a mikvah. Then, if the kli also happened to have been used with prohibited flavors, it needs hagolas kelim as well. As mentioned, Rashi's basis for this for his interpretation is the Mishnah of Olazar, which discusses how one kashers utensils persons from a Gentile. The Gemara there which explains that all such utensils must also be immersed in a mikvah. The Gemara derives that from the word vitaher, and it shall be pure. Says the Mishnah of Olazar, halokech kli tash mishmanagoy, if you buy some kind of utensil that is used to cook from a non-Jew, eshadar kolahad vilyatya. The you need tvila, that's the transferring of possession issue. Lahagia, that which requires hagola, meaning if the vessel had absorbed a prohibited flavor, yagil. Those lalabin ba'or, yalabin ba'or, that means if the vessel had absorbed the prohibited flavor directly through fire, you need libun gomer, you need white hot fire. Like that's why you use a torch, the blow torch. Like you remember in camp, there we go up and blow torch ovens and things like that because that was direct fire. Those vessels, th those vessels that absorb through hot water, you can dump in a hot water bath. Two different issues. More tana, the kulan trichim tefila bar boim son. No matter what, a vessel purchased from a gentile requires tefila and a mikvah of forty saw. Not a mili. Amar Rav Adamar Kra, kol davar sheyavo ba esh tavir ba esh v'taher. There's two taras. There's purification from Isser. And then there's this purification. Although no reason is given explicitly for this mitzvah in the Gemara quoted above, an explanation is given in the Talmud Yerushalmi. Shalom Rabbi Yirmiya, Omar, Tzarech Lahad Bilufnei Shiyotzum and Tumas Anachri, B'nechnus Ulegdushas Yisrael. The putting a kli in a mikvah is because this kli has transferred from Tumas Nochri and has entered to Kedushas Yisrael. In other words, the reason for the mitzvah is that because the utensils are spiritually elevated, when they transition from the jurisdiction of a Gentile to that of a Jew, they must be spiritually purified beforehand. The, I'm going to read the footnote. The Yushami is quoted by the Ritva, who compares Tfilas Kalim to the immersion undergoing by a convert during the process of Geru. Just as there, the convert immerses to spiritually elevate the body to the level necessary for becoming a Jew, so too, one must do the same thing to a utensil upon receiving Jewish ownership. So we can think of this Tfilas Kalim almost like Giyur, like when a, when, a, when a utensil enters the Jewish home, it's like we're Rimagayarit. And it requires mikvah just like a convert requires it. I think it's a, I think the Ritva's imagery is, 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 is phenomenal imagery. Is the mitzvah tefillah kelim doraisa or drabon? On one end, the source for the mitzvah appears to be from the Torah. We learned it out from Sukkim. On the other hand, it's not explicit. The Rishonim dispute this question. Though according to most Rishonim, the obligation for Tfilas Kalim is Doraisa. And this is clearly the position of the Truma Sadeshen in his discussion below concerning whether a minor, a cotton, may perform Tfilas Kalim. Shayla. Kli matcha salakuach v'nanochri. If you bought a, a metal vessel from a non-Jew, Shetzorach Tfilah, can you send a minor as a shaliach to the mikvah with the kli for the minor to perform the, the mikvah? Tshuva. 
It's not permitted. The miners not believe that he did it. Even though he can, you know, he can do this issue, it's not a very difficult task. But it that for a rabbinic mitzvah, the a cotton can be used. Women in avodim, not ketani. So minors are not believed by rabbinic or by the rice of law. Or, or the Tosas over there learns that they, they're believed by rabbinic law. Based on this, Tosas states that women and slaves are reliable concerning Torah level prohibitions. It's clear from the Truma Sadeshan that he holds that the mitzvah filas kelim is deraisa. Some Rishonim hold that the obligation to immerse utensils is only rabbinic. Accordingly, the psukin that we cite is just an asmachta, a, an illusion. Who holds like that? The Rambam. In Hilchos Machalos Asuros, Tvila Zu, Shemadvilin Klei Asuda Nelkochim Nagoy. This type of immersion, when we buy a, a utensil that we use for a meal, that we buy from a Gentile, Vachakak Yutru Lachilov Yusin, and then you can use them for eating and drinking. A non la inyan tum of a tahara, element of It's It's rabbinic. The Roma's law called Dover Shevo Baish Tavir Baish Vitaher. It was just the Mesorah. This is not a, some kind of Tuma that's going on here because we can't get rid of Tuma through fire. You need Poraduma uh, and Tvila. This has to do with prohibition of food that gets absorbed through fire, and then you have to do hagola with fire. But that's regarding the other part of the pasuk. But when it says v'taher or mechachamim hoysef lo tarach acher averoso be'esh latir migule goyim, that after you get rid of the absorption of the prohibited flavors through fire, there's another tahara. Which is in the mikvah. The Taz in the Shulchan Aruch adopts the majority opinion that immersing utensils is a Torah level commandment. Mm -hmm. And he rules in accordance with Truman Sedeshan that a child is not believed to perform the mitzvah. Says the Shulchan Aruch, Ein ma minim kot not filas kelim. Says the Ramah of Alim Tuvalu Lufnei Godel. If the cotton did it in front of an adult, <coughs> Habi Tvila. And says the Tazim Mami and Cotton, the fish at Philas Kalim Doraiso. However, he agrees, and 12th they got also Tfila. If you do it in front of an adult, it would work. Ravovadi Yosef clarifies that the entire dispute in Lilim Shokhrok that Philas Kalim is Doraiso pertains only to metal utensils, because they were mentioned explicitly by Moshe. With relation to glass, all authorities maintain that the obligation is only rabbinic. And therefore, if you have a doubt, did they have tefillah or did not have tefillah, and you can use the vessel if, even if there was a doubt. Does the Allah of tefillah's kalim cause food that is placed in a utensil owned by a Jew, but bought from a non-Jew, that has not been toivu? So, does it... Do, do, is it become usher if you put food in such a kli? According to the Ramah, the answer is that although one does not violate, although one does violate the prohibition by using utensil prior to tefillah, I mean, you have a chi of tefillah, you didn't do it, but the food is not forbidden, whether it was placed or cooked inside, whether you cook it or just put it there, the food does not, you don't usher the food. You violated it, uh, a, a derisa, uh, 
according to Truman Sadesha and according to those, the Rambam, the uh, rabbinic law of doing Tfilas Kalim, but it doesn't answer the food. Says the Ramah explicitly in your day, Akuf Chav, Im over Vishtamish Bakliblo Tvila, if a person violated the law and used the Kli without immersion, Lo Nesar Bosh Nishtamish Bo. It doesn't ask for the food. You go ahead and do the tefillah. But, you know, let's say all of a sudden after you have the meal, you remembered, uh, or when, you know, even when you put the food in, you haven't eaten it yet, you're allowed to eat it. Next time you go to the mikvah, take the kli along and, and be toy with it. Same position is adopted by the bir alacha. The bir alacha is the chafetz chaim, the, the author of the Mishnah Bura, which adds that all agree that it's merely a rabbinic prohibition to use a utensil prior to its immersion. Vashenke b'lchi chodesh, gami yishtamish b'lchi tefillah, ena Michael Nesser. The afal gab d'avid isura, he made an isser, the vashem yishtamish b'lchi tefillah, filo hach mishum ze lo gazrinan shem agisha. We don't make a gzeira that maybe uh, if, we, if we, maybe we should ask for the food because you're going to keep the Keep the clean your house and forget to be toyed with. No, says the Bira Lava. Keep in the Kulpani. Ain't no Ochel Isser. He's not eating Isser. Vagam ain't Isser Zekim and Rabbonon. So you see there very explicitly that he holds that the Isser is only Rabbonon. Filo, that's a servant of that Filo Umina Torah. Oh, it says, even though the opinions that the Tfil is Umina Torah, but if you use it without Tfil, you've only violated a Rabbonon. Okay, page 150. Any questions so far? Comments? Mm -hmm. Okay, page 150. We'll now begin to examine some of the halachic rules concerning Tvilas Kalim. The first issue relates to ownership. The Gemara states that one is only obligated to Tvilas Kalim when one actually acquires food related utensils that were owned by a gentle. What if, if merely borrowing a utensil from a Gentile, he has no obligation to immerse it, since the Gentile is still the owner? Thus, Tfilas Kalim is only obligatory upon utensils owned by a Jew, not utensils used by a Jew that still belongs to a Gentile. A big question, okay, a big question that we're going to deal with is... Yeah, you stray food. No, is what's going to happen when, you, when we sell our our chametz stick a kalim to non-Jews for Pesach. And now they own it. And now we get it back. Do we have to do tvila Because they were in the possession of the Gentile at that point. So just keep that in mind. Om Rav Nachman, Om Rav Hua, Lo Shonu El Abil That, you gotta, it, that's, if you buy it from a non-Jew, who commits a shahaya. But if you just borrow a utensil, then of course you would have to do hagala because you assume that the that the non-Jew has used it for prohibited items. Um, but you wouldn't you wouldn't need tefillas kelim. So Ernie, Ernie, are you saying that if you buy a utensil from a Jewish-owned store in Brooklyn, you don't have to do anything with the utensil because it was owned by a Jew? Absolutely. Yeah. Now we're going to see. Harold's is a very good question. We're going to see about if, it, if the factory is owned by a Gentile, but it's a Jewish workers. So these are very good questions. We're going to cover all of them. It's a good, it's a good point, Harold. We'll, we'll deal with that. But yes, if it's complete, if it was, the, if, if it was sold by, if it was always in the possession of a Jew, and he sells it to you, you don't have to do tefillah skin. What if it was a Jewish company? A good question like that would be if you went to, in Israel and you bought a Kiddush come from Hatzorfim. Israel is, you're gonna, Chaim, you're also anticipating what we're gonna deal with. We're gonna talk about what happens in Israel. In Israel, where, we, where the rove is Jews, especially if you don't know, you can, you can always rely on rove. Although you don't know about imports. You don't know where they're, they're really, uh, a lot of these things from Hatzorfim, are bought in a certain way, and then they do a finishing where they add 
they add components to it afterwards. Okay, but if they but if they bought it, if if they bought it and it's owned by a Jew and it's sold to you, no, they they it, bought they buy the silver. They could be buying the silver, sort of like they buy a cup without the adornment on it, just a plain silver cup, already made, and they buy it from China from a goy, but it's a working cup. And then they go and they add things to it, but we don't really. I mean, you don't really know what where the, the owner that the owner the one who sold it to you is, is Jewish. Yeah, it wasn't original. I know, but with the Jew, where the, where the Jewish, where the Jew buy it from? So let's we'll see. Okay. That's, these are very good questions. We're going to deal with all of them. Because if you have a Jewish-owned store, and then why do they have these mikvahs in, in in Brooklyn? You know, in the stores where the tefillah scaling they they do it there. If they own the, the merchandise and then they sell it to another Jew, so what's the purpose of the mikvahs? Well, we'll in see. As I said, if we'll, we'll see what what triggers ownership and what does not trigger ownership. We're going to see it in this in this sim. In addition, the Rajma writes that even, even if someone rents a utensil from a Gentile, there is no requirement to immerse it. So right now we have borrowing. You don't have to do tefillah scaling. And rental, you don't have to do tefillah scaling. Shal kelim chadoshim nagoi. That's, rent, that's borrowing. You rented it. You can use it right away. Does not require tefillah. Means it has to be, if it's owned by a Jew, then he needs tefillah. Like the vessels of Midian that the Jews took booty and it became their personal possession. Usha'ela, uschiras, ain't konim. Borrowing or renting is not, uh, you don't acquire it. So you got to acquire it. Shukhanar adopts the Rajba. Ashrel usocha klima goy, and a ton tvila. Avom Yisrael kono ma goy, but if a Jew bought it from a non Jew, vihish ilu lechavero, and loaned it to his friend, ho un tvila. The moment it, it got into the possession of the first Jew, you're chayab tefillah. So if no one had done the tefillah yet and the other guy borrowed it, before he had done the tefillah, he would have to do the tefillah before he, before he uses it. Now, the Orch HaShulchan addresses a different aspect of this issue. What is the Allah when one purchases a utensil from a Gentile-owned factory where many of the employees are Jews or vice versa? The factory is owned by a Jew and the employees are non-Jews. What's the din? Do either of these qualify as purchasing it from Gentile? <clears throat> the Orach HaShochan rules that the actual ownership determines the obligation, not the status of the workers who made it. Therefore, in the first case, where it's a Gentile-owned factory, the utensils must be immersed with a bracha. And in the opposite case, where a Jew owns the factory, Tevila is not required. Orach HaShulchan. Yesh mi shekosav. The Yisrael HaMachzik Beit Charoshet. If a Jew owns a factory. She'osin klei zchuchit. Makes glassware. Vapualim goyim. O lehefech. Or the opposite. She'amachzik goy. That the owner is the non-Jew. Pualim Yisraeli. Yesh li smoch ala makilim. Ulishtamish behen below tevila. We're talking about glassware. You could be mako and use them without tvila because Klis Chuchas is on Rabbi Bonham. He, he said that there was somebody had written that. Vlone Hirali Klau. Orchel Shukhan says, I don't understand that. Avobeza Klali, Kemo Fabrik, which is a factory. Sha'osin Kalim Lemeo Sulalafim that make hundreds or thousand pieces. We go after who owns the factory. It's called his. They're just day workers. So if a Jewish factory makes metal kalim, they're potter from tvila. Even if the workers who work for the Jewish factory are non-Jews, if the owner of the factory is non-Jew 
and the workers are Jews, would require even glassware would chayv tefila with a bracha. Lachen kisha kona kli matkos o klis chuchis. Sarich leida miu bala esek. If if you are buying it from a store, you need to know who owns the business that produced the utensils, and that will determine whether or not it needs tefila skelim. So according to Rav Tzvi Kohn, the author of the tefila skelim, utensils must be immersed even if they are produced by a company owned by both a Jew and a Gentile. Let's say they're partners. Some say don't make the bracha, but you still have to do it. And same as if it's a corporation or stockholders. Some are Jewish, some are Gentiles. So those would require tefillah's kid. Now, let's say we don't know who the ownership of the specific company, but the utensil was made by a company in a place or context that most of the companies are owned by Jews, like Eretz Yisrael. The Yalkut Yosef rules that the utensil does not require immersion because the halach is determined in accordance with road. If you're in a locale where the majority of the factories that are making utensils are Jewish owned and you bought vessels and you don't know, we go after the rov and you would not require tefillah. This halacha may be relevant concerning utensils for food that state made in Israel on the packaging like Kiddush cups, since the majority of companies that produce these items in Israel are owned by Jews. Now, what is the halacha, where a utensil is originally owned by a Jew, but sold or transferred to a Gentile, and then reacquired by a Jew? According to Shulchan Aruch, it still must be immersed prior to use, since every time a Jew acquires the utensil from a Gentile, it requires tefillah. Yisrael Shemacha Kli Lagoy. The let, a Jew, so, let's say a Jew sold his vessel to a non-Jew. The Chazav Alakum then bought it back. Tzarek Tefila. Although this principle that even okay, so we're going to go go into Pesach. So, so I would say the following Chaim: If Hatzorfim is buying raw silver from a from a from a uh, from a commodity uh, source, and that's a non-Jew, and they manufacture the silver goblet in Hatzorfim, then of course it doesn't need tefillah. If they bought a cup, um, now, if you adore it, the question is, is a shinoi, you know, sometimes shinoi makes it a new cup, and it changes it. But certainly if you were just a, like a go-between, and you bought it, you know, it was manufactured by a non-Jew, and then and the Jew is selling it. You would have to do tefillah. The issue of adornment is more complicated because of the concept of shinui. And is shinui enough to make it so now it's manufactured by the Jew, or not? And that would require you know a posek to comment on. It. So, so uh, are you are you going to cover the uh, the issue of mechiras um, kalim? Yes, absolutely. It's coming, okay. It's coming right now. No, but I was just summarizing because I think your question was a very good question. And I think it hinges on what we've learned already and that we can answer some of those questions. Um, and, but, but the adornment is more, more complicated, right? So if you're a factory that's buying raw goods and the raw goods are coming, raw goods are not a cleave. So that doesn't fall into the category of Tfilah's Caleb. You made the cleave. And you're a Jew, then if somebody buys it from you, they don't have to do tefillah's kelim. Now, what Johnny said, uh, stores in Brooklyn, because they're acquiring kelim that were made by non-Jews, it's owned by them, they're just selling it, so you'd have to do tefillah's kelim. Johnny? Is Johnny there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, you understand? If you're, if you're buying a store, you know, it's, that store is just a middleman. Okay. And the own, we'll see that the owners, 
you know, let's but say the, if you buy, they're not required to do tefillah scaling because they're not, they're not using it. You have to do tefillah scaling before immersion, before use. But when the store owner buys it and he pays for them, he takes possession of them, right? So that now he owns them. Yeah, but he doesn't, he doesn't require to do tefillah. We're going to learn that later too. Okay. He's not required to do tefillah because he's not using it. So you mean the end user is the one who requires the tefillah, basically? You cannot use, yeah, you cannot, you cannot use the utensil without tefillah. And we'll see that your issue about somebody buying it and just passing it through will also come up later on. It will, it will be addressed. Now, although this principle that even temporary ownership by a Gentile necessitates immersion is logical and appears to be a simple one, it, yield, it yields a startling conclusion. When one sells utensils to a Gentile before Pesach, as part of the sale of chametz, which is the commonly accepted practice. We don't just sell our chametz, we sell all of our dishes because our dishes have absorbed chametz. So that's why Rabbi, that's why Rabbi Kraus always asks us, where, you know, where's the chametz, where's the dishes? Because he sells those. But when one reacquires them after Pesach, one should logically have to be toyful them. Ernie, are you sure uh, about selling dishes? Because I'm not so sure that um, that's the case. I, I remember I was asking about Einhorn about that, that we sell the chametz that may be on the dishes, but the dishes themselves, because dishes themselves really, they're chametz dick, you can't use them because they can bring over chametz, but I don't think the dishes themselves So are hang on, so hang on. There's a clause, there's a clause in the sale contract that was going to resolve the issue. But lechura, when we sell our chametz, we're selling the kalim as well. So the Piskei Tshuva says, it's preferable therefore not to sell them. When you sell a cauldron to a non-Jew Arab Pesach, it would require tefillah after Pesach if you sold them the kli. So therefore, better not to sell them. For this reason, the generally accepted custom today is to write in the contract of selling the chametz, drawn by the rabbi, that one merely sells the chametz crumbs inside the utensil, or the flavor of chametz that absorbed in the utensil, not the utensil itself. It should be noted, says the footnote, that the poskim debate whether a person is required to sell the absorbed chametz at all. Some soifer sites post who don't require that. There were also some who rented their utensils to the Gentile while selling the chametz inside. In this manner, no tefillah would be required. Others hold that the evidence if one did not follow one of these suggestions, the utensils do not need to be toyful. In their opinion, tefillah is required only when the sale is intended to be a permanent one. While for a temporary sale, as Mechir's chametz, even though it's halachically valid, tefillah's kale is not required since the utensils are not called by the name of the Gentile. And why, why isn't nobody making any distinction between a sale that requires Mashiach and, and, and a sale that's just done through a, you know, lifting of a pen? Is it, is it a big difference? When it, when, if, a, if you give a goy, he takes, a, if a goy, you don't even sell the goy, but let's say the goy borrows, borrows the, ut the utensil, you, right? You don't, he, he only, by doing Mashiach, he's already, in a sense, taking no. over. Chaim, but the 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 Kenyan agap, the Kenyan chalipin that we do by lifting the pen is a full fledged Kenyan, and it transfers our ownership when 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 the contract is is triggered, the, the Kenyan flows like just like any other Kenyan. But is that is that a Kenyan deraisa or Kenyan derabanan? No, it's a full Kenyan. It's a full Kenyan. Yeah, full Kenyan. Otherwise, it would, otherwise the mechiras chametz wouldn't work. So, for example. Uh, Chaim, a kinyan chalipin is used. Let's say you have a tractor. A kinyan chalipin itself would not work. No, right. let's, say you have, let's say you have a tractor in Minnesota. You're purchasing a tractor in Minnesota. Now, and you're in Los Angeles. And you're buying it from a Jew. 
So you do a Kenyan Kalipin with him, but when you lift the pen, so now there's a, that, that, the tractor becomes yours. That's a Kenyan Kalipin. You, 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 so you don't have to go to Minnesota to physically right, take right. possession of it through Mashiach, et cetera, et cetera. That's, the, that's yeah, how the Kenyan Kalipin works. That's fine, but even then, the, the, the Goy still, even though the Goy owns it, he has not really touched, he's not really taken usage of the Kli. What would happen? Oh, actually, on this case, well, just how about this? The Chacham Shlaim and the Rosh Hashanah said it doesn't have a shame. That's enough. If it's not the Gentile that we sold our, our Kalim to over the Pesach, it doesn't become fully his because it's not called. His. That's what we said. It says uh, first of all, since it's not intended to be a permanent sale, even though it's a sale for that those eight days, right? It's the utensils are not caused by called by the name of the Gentile. If it's not his, it's not called his through his shame, that's a way to get around requiring it. Okay, so what happens? So are you going to cover what happens when the, when the, when the goy actually borrows the utensil? So by borrow, by, no, but they said some people rent it to them. And then you remember we said renting doesn't require Tfilas Kalim. So remember some, some sell the chametz and only rent the vessel. Oh, okay. Then you don't have the problem. Then after yet, when you get it back, you don't have to do. There's no problem. Feel us, Caleb. Now I want to read footnote five. Nowadays, the vast majority of utensils are made in China, and elsewhere around the world. Therefore, one must assume that utensils require tefila, unless it clearly states that they are made in Israel, and that's regardless who sells them. Right. That's this issue of you know the uh, a middle a Jewish middleman bought it. It would it requires tefila. It requires tefillah when you bought it because it was manufactured by a, by a non-Jew. Another variation of this issue of ownership arises when a Jew and a Gentile jointly purchase a utensil is one obligated to scaling if it's still partially owned by the Gentile. We can derive the answer from the underlying reason for immersion that we mentioned above, namely that the utensil must be spiritually purified in order to transition from the ownership of the Gentile to the sanctity of Jewish ownership. Since, in this case, it is not entirely Jewishly owned. Tefillah should not be required. And that's in fact how the Ramah rules. Yisrael v'goy shekano kli b'shutafut e'tefillah. And the Shach infers from here that if the Jew later acquired the portion of the utensil owned by the Gentile, then you'd have to do tefillah. Mash with the Hayin Shardana kli mektos v'shalom v'kachavim v'fum v'chazim v'kanach so if later on you purchase the non-Jews share and it's owned by you totally, now it's moved completely into your possession, it would require tefillah. Now, page 154. Which materials require immersion? Most reassuring about the position that immersing utensils is required with the rice. So this is true of utensils made of metal, gold, silver, iron, lead, steel, since the primary obligation of tefillah applies to them. All agree that glass utensils must be immersed before use, and that's only Rabbana. And that's apparent from the Gemara of Odezara. Rav Yitzhak Bar Yosef Zavid Mana de Marda. He bought a Kli from Marda, who was a Gentile. I'm sorry, Marda is a mixture of earth and dung. And he bought it me going. Sover lad vila, he was going to be toivile. Omer le omer abonon, rabbi Yaakov Shmei, lididi mevashal le minei rabbi Yechnon, who was explained to rabbi Yechnon, and Kli clean matzah somewhere in the parsha, that only metals made, made of metal. And this is not metal, so you don't have to be toivile. Omer Vashi, what about honey clay schuchis, glassware, hoyo vachim ishtabu yesh len takona, since when you break them, you can fix it. It's considered like metal. Kunya. This is leather, lead coated earthenware utensils. It's, you treat it since they started off, started, started off as earthenware, and earthenware don't require tefillah, it remains that way. 
No, since you coat it with lead, lead is a metal, we treat it like the sofa, the hilchasuk is sofa. Now, it's clear from the Gemara that other types of utensil not made out of metal or glass, such as earthenware, are not subject to tefillah's kedem. But if they are coated or covered with metal, the conclusion is that they must be toifer. Toifus, though, limits this to where it is covered with metal on the inside, as the metal must actually be an important part of the utensil's function. Or if the metal component comes in contact with food, accordingly, if the metal component comes in contact with food, the obligation of tefillah's kedem applies but for example, if there's only metal outside, but inside there's no metal, it would not require tefillah. that are covered with lead If they were covered only on the outside, or pleates, wooden kelim, hamechushakim saviv barza, and they put some wood around it mibachutz, but it doesn't come in contact with the food. Even according to the opinion, who says, you look at the sort of the material that's sort of holding the kli intact, still ain't sarachin tefila. Kiva de mishdamshim ben derech amatchis. You're not using them through the metal. The kli suda morim be parsha anu shemishdamshim ben. The metal kli kli utensils we're talking about are metal that are going to be used with food. And the shulchan aruch adopts this concept of tosfus. If you buy a vessel from a non-Jew, made out of metal or glass, or you bought vessels that are uh, uh, coated with lead, but the lead is on the inside of the kli which touches the food, even though they're new, it requires tefillah's kelim. The Shulchan Aruch does not directly address the case where the utensil is only covered or coated with metal on the outside. But it would seem that Shulchan Aruch would agree with Tosfos and exempt such a utensil from tefillah entirely. The view of the Ramah differs from that of the Shulchan Aruch. According to the Ramah, if the utensil is lined on the inside with metal, it must be immersed without a broth. Similarly, in the case of a utensil which is coated with metal on the outside, it should be immersed without a broth. Yeshoimrim, the kelim of tzurim be'eber filu be'vifnim yitbo b'lo bracha b'chein noakim. So the Ashkenaz minig is to do tefillah without a bracha if if the vessel is only lined with metal. As such, there are two disputes between the Shulchan and the Ramah. Utensils covered with metal on the outside alone. The Shulchan says you don't require tefillah at all. The Ramah says you do tefillah without a bracha if the kli has metal on the inside. The Shulchan says you are toivel with a bracha. And also the Ramos says, you toivel them without a bracha. So if the utensils line with men on both inside and outside, the Ramo would agree that it should be immersed with a bracha. Rav Avadya Yosef also adopts the position of the Ramo on this point. Even though normally Rav Avadya only, usually Paskins like the Maron Shulchan Aruch, he rules to recite a bracha only if the utensils completely coated both within and without. In Halichas Oilam, he says, "Uklicheres that's earthenware kelim, hametsupim mivifnim ubachutz beaver that's covered with lead, uveschuchis or glass, trichin tefila bebracha. They need tefila with a bracha. Vim ena metsupim if they're only covered al arak mivifnim, yet bilam below bracha, which is against the Shulchan Aruch, but like the Ramah. Rav Avadi explains further in this passage that the reason is that suffik brachos lahakil when it's uncertain that a bracha must be recited, you leave the bracha out. This is true, he says, even when it stands in op opposition to the ruling of the Shulchan Aruch. Accordingly, only when the utensil is completely coated and all opinions are in agreement should a bracha be recited upon the immersion. The importance in these sources, given in these sources to the status of the coating or covering, has important implications for a common case nowadays. Must a frying pan made of metal, but with a Teflon coating, you need to toy with that. In this case, the pan is metal, but the coating that directly touches the food is not. In Sefer Tvilas Kalim, it writes that coating is the determining factor. Therefore, since the Teflon touches the food and in fact separates between the food and the metal, Tvila with the brook is not performed. Nevertheless, 
it should be performed without a bracha because Teflon itself contains glass components. And we've already said that you have to be toivel glass. Meet Rabbonin without a bracha. We saw above from the Gemara that if utensils made of utensils, that if a utensil is made of materials other than metal and glass, no tefillah is required. Thus, earthenware, pottery, ceramic, stone, wood, or paper, all do not require immersion, as ruled by the Rabbah. Metal. Wood, or stone. You have to wash it and rinse it, right? Because he, there he's talking about to remove the absorptions from non-kosher food. But And the Pisgah Tshuv extends it to porcelain utensils. I am B'Shel Yaivitz, Rav Yaakov Emden, because of the Kelim Aboim, Mdina Sayam Shinikri in porcelain, the doyim leklis chuches ain't zrichin letfila lefish yoduish asuyos from inachol. They're made from sand. Umina adama uklimatus amuva parsha. We have to only use metal. Vafal gab the sheet fei, even the very smooth lesson bar. That klichuchus shreit fei minayu. Glass is even more smooth. Vilavish on the chinishbu. The only reason we are toivel glass is because if they break, yesham takon. Shemachik uklimatus shabinu. Hi. But this porcelain doesn't have a takon if it breaks. So that's why it's not like glass. And many posts can agree with the Pisne Tshuva, though some have the more stringent practice to immerse porcelain utensils without a bracha, as known by the Sefer Kashrus, in a summary of which materials are subject to Tfilas Kim. He says, Klimatris, Chayovim. Metal needs Advod and Torah. What's considered metal? Zahab, gold, of silver, nechoshes, copper, barzel, iron, bedil, which is tin, oiferous, lead, mirusta, steel, ushar matras, clay aluminum, clay ami enamel, matvilim below bracha. You, you toivel them, but no bracha. Wait, enamel, or, enamel uh, or aluminum? Both enamel. aluminum and enamel, and the enamel. Both, you do tefillah without a bracha. Klis chuches chayavim batvol mirabbanon in bracha. It's the tefillah is only mirabbanon, but you do do a bracha. Uviklal has chuches duralax, pyrex, and corel. Yes no? Those require tefillah with a bracha. Clay porcelain, uvechlolam charsina mitzuva b'schuches. This is uh, glazed pottery, right? Avshi yeshar mishenem trichin fila kiven shlekama deas trichin nagu rabim ladvilam blah. It's a machlokes. So the, many people do do tefila without bracha. This refers to utensils made of porcelain, ceramic, or china. That are glazed with a thin layer of glass. This is quite common nowadays in dishes, mugs, and the like. The Sefer Kashrus notes that many are machmer to immerse these due to the layer of glass on top. However, this is different than the cover or coating of lead discussed above the Shukhrach and Ramah, since this layer is significantly thinner than that. Therefore, it is subject to some dispute. And some say that one should immerse it like the Ramah for Ashkenazim, while others hold that there is not necessary for such a thin layer of glass. So you can see that in that issue, there's a debate. Klicheres, Karsina Vikarmika. This is uh, earthenware, pottery, ceramic, even, eights, stone, wood, niyar, einan trichin hadvo. Do not require tvila. Bios. Hang on. What about plastic? With respect to plastic, the acronym are divided. The Tzitz Eliezer writes that there is no need to immerse them since they are not similar to either metal or glass. When you buy vessels from Goyim, they only need tefillah if they're metal. 
Lerova posk me atorah klichuchis. Lerova posk me rabbon in glass. Rabbinic. Kemavuar. Ravot azor. And it gives you all the sources. Venifsek biyardeh, which we just learned. Imkena klia plastic. Ain't I'm turning to be the cloud. Kivadai. Kivadai. Hoover. Sheena be klimat. Because vegan. They're not glass. They're not metal. However. Since they can be repaired when melted down, much like glass, the Minchas Yitzchak argues, Dayan Weiss just passed away not, not, not that long ago, that they must be immersed. Nevertheless, because of the opinions that exempt plastic completely, he agrees that it should be done without a bracha. I asked him an expert that a chomish of plastic, Vanasa, Ome Eitzim, they're made out of. Wood. Mechelev, fat. On in some bakarka, or things in the ground. The Yeshbem Shnei Minim, Echad Shah. Achar Shanase Kli, E. Efshar Latichan. There are two types of plastic. Some are made in a, in a way where even after it were, once you've made it into a Kli, you can't melt it down. But in Shani, there's another type of plastic that you can melt and make it clear again. So he says to be toivel them without a bracha. Since you can melt it, it's like glass. But he says, don't, even though by glass where we make a bracha, here you should not make a bracha. Kosuk for Tarosu B'Shem Melamed Lahoyel. Melamed Lahoyel was the Rav Tzvi David Hoffman, who was in Germany, you know, in the Rav Hildesheimer Seminary. So he's also in the 20th century. The Yeshlam are keeping the Chachamenu Zalogazu Raka Klis Chuches. Lochalak Zeil Shardvon. This Gzeir doesn't call on anything else. It's specific for glass. I got the Kosuk for Tarosu B'Shem Melamed Same thing they said Portsmouth. It's a very nice biography the Minchas Yitzchak was in London. Then, then they invited him to Shalim and he was the, the uh, poisic for Neda Haredis for 30, 40 years. Rav Vadya Yosef rules that according to the strict letter of the law, plastic is exempt. But those who wish to be stringent to immerse plastic utensils without a brach are praiseworthy. When the Inyan Kalim Plastim on Nylon Akani Migoy in Trichem Tvila, you name a sechla vanizara, mavuar, Trichli Cheres Enam Trichem Tvila, you don't need earthenware, does not need Tvila. He should have the Vaparsha's clay midian, Lonon, or the cold clay matos, the whole partial is metal. Ramavashi cleans Kukis Alalu, Holbin Nishborn Yeshlam Takana. Our glassworks, if they break, you can fix them because you can melt them and make it again. Dinam can clean matos, so they're treated like metal. Lachura, clean plastic, Shefta Latikam, those plastic utensils that you can melt. And refashion it to a new kli. The last one says, "Vem kelim yesh the damosim l'kliksuches." We should treat them like glass. Well, chavim b'tfilo ulam b'shut melamed lo oil, which we quoted. Cause of sheish shlomish shakli etzem hanikim migoy enam trichem tfilo bone kelim made out of bone do not require tfilo. Avul b'shevshul latichem. Even though I guess you could break them down and make a new one. Last one says, "Vem kelim." He, he relies on this concept that maybe when Chazal made the Gzair, it was only on glass. So Ravavadya Paskins, they don't require Tvila. Plastic. Today, the widespread common practice is not to immerse plastic utensils. What is the Allah when a utensil is made out of a number of different materials, such as metal and wood together? Does it require tefila? The answer is that it stands determined by the primary component. These are pictures made of iron. Faucets made of iron. Matris. Kulan They need tefila. As long as it's metal. If it's mainly wood, rock shema at barzel covers a little metal there. Hold the actual establishment of law barzel. 
The kli can be used without a barzel, without the iron, ain't sarach tefillah. Of a kli ametukan, be a tedotchel barzel. But let's say the kli is made with nails, made out of iron, that without the nails, there would be no kli. According to the Ramah, if the metal portion serves an important function within the utensil without which it would not work properly, then the utensil requires tefillah with a bra. Yes? Interesting question on this is um, you mentioned the Kli. Um, I wonder to what degree we have to be concerned with anyone that has um, a water heater. It's a Kli. It's yeah, but we're going to see. Hold, hold on to your horses, Chaim. We're going to see what does it mean, Kli Suda? There's going to be an Indian of Kli Suda that requires Tvila. Okay. And then the qu question will be, for example, storage came. We'll see whether they're considered clay suda, but uh, uh, I'm not sure a hot water clay would be a would be a clay suda. Okay, we're going to stop here. We'll we'll finish um, we'll finish part one very quickly, and next week, and then we'll go into part two of of Hilchas Tfilas Kain. We might be able to finish the whole thing because it's not that much. When, when is uh, book six coming out? Book, I've already ordered book six for everybody. Okay. okay? Are you, what about a